Once again, we get underway as the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton. And those of you near and far away, welcome tonight. We have an interesting evening as we get back into the swing of things, being astronomers and having our Princeton connections. So uh, you can see uh, the agenda on the screen here. And in a few moments, we'll turn it over here to Victor and he'll introduce our guest speaker. But I had a couple of announcements that I want to get through. Uh, and then as we like to structure the evening um, after the main talk, we'll take about a five minute break um, and then come back. And this is when we like to do astronomy by and for members. And we have a journal club and we have some observatory events and some other things we want to discuss. So we urge you all to come back after the main talk is over and hear about what's going on in our club. Anytime after this meeting in the future, if you want to get in touch with me, there it is. And I would also just mention I have a website dedicated to astronomy that I do, my astrophotography, Rex Parker Pixels, and you're welcome to peruse that uh, anytime in the future as well. Yeah, so it has been a twisty, curvy path that got us to where we are today, hasn't it? And summer's over, so where do we go from here, guys? Well, the whales are saying, I guess we'll never know why they beached themselves. <laughs> um, but, you know, this summer has been a great time to get away from it all. And I hope that astronomy was part of your summer. It certainly was mine. I know that a number of our members took advantage of it and got out to the observatory. And we had an actually a pretty good season, especially lately, although the first half of it left something to be desired. But as you can see here, we are meeting by Zoom and it makes it difficult for us to present to members our strong connections with Princeton University. This is our actual home when we convene as a, an in face-to-face -face meeting where the Peyton Hall of Astrophysics is situated right next to the football stadium on the Princeton campus. And now we're longing for it because it's been a year plus. And Michael Strauss, the chair of astrophysics at Princeton sends his regrets and has asked me to convey to you that uh, Princeton University's rules will not allow them to accept guests on the premises. So our club is not going to be able to meet at Peyton Hall, at least over the next few months. We don't know what the longer range future brings. Obviously, none of us do. I can only speak for the next few months. So we've made every preparation to keep Zooming our meetings once a month here. And obviously, we're going to keep members posted as any changes occur that let us get back on campus. And so there'll be more to be said about that later. So future meetings of the AAAP, let's face it, guys, let's count our blessings because it can get worse. <laughs> it can get better, but it can get worse. So there you go, a little, little graveyard humor there. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> there are a few roles that are coming up and the board met just a couple of weeks ago to talk about where we are in the club. And I'm just tossing this out there goes my screen advancer when I don't want it to. Uh, we'll talk about this after the break. There are some uh, opportunities for members to take an active role in the club that we'll get back to after the break, break. as well as some observatory events that uh, we wanted to convey to you. And again, this will be a topic after the break, but we're going to extend access of members as well as public to the uh, to the observatory since it is one place where we can meet in person and that's going quite well out there. So let's talk about this some more after the break, but I want you to be aware of this, that it's not going to end at the end of October as our public nights and our member access nights normally would. Maybe you could say uh, global warming is playing to our advantage for some winter time observing here. But there are some interesting things happening in the sky and the Sky 10 software that we like to use out at the observatory is one way to depict the, the celestial objects that are available for viewing. And this is uh, looking straight up towards the zenith. The zenith would be right here. There's a little marker uh, at about 10 p.m. mid-month here in central New Jersey. And a couple of objects uh, worth mentioning, but you can see laid out a lot of Messier objects and NGC objects and things that maybe we'll talk about as the night goes on, what kinds of things that we can observe. A number of them lie in the plane of the Milky Way that goes right through Cygnus the Swan here, one of our favorite um, constellations, uh, perfectly situated this time of year. 
right here in the left wing of the swan, like maybe that's his right wing, depending on the way you're looking at it, there's a supernova remnant. And right up here in Cassiopeia, there's a really cool uh, nebula. And I'm just going to show you the types of things that we can do with amateur equipment. Believe it or not, this is an image of the NGC 6992, the Veil Nebula, which is a supernova remnant from a supernova that went thousands of years ago and it's expanding way out in space and it's far larger than the image scale here, but this is like the eastern end of it, sometimes called the Cirrus Nebula. And this is captured right here from central Jer New Jersey on my home 12 and a half inch reflector, showing you that yes, we can indeed do some deep sky observing from New Jersey. This is sometimes called the Pac-Man Nebula. This is the guy in Cassiopeia. And this is something we can look at through the club telescope and, and uh, astro camera again taken right here from my backyard and this is a relatively short set of exposures to get this image only a couple of hours of total exposure i mentioned to you guys that i've gone the other way and gotten access to a renewed group down in the chilean andes and we've come online full speed and i'm, I'm i have the very great privilege of having access to a 24 inch uh, telescope that is located at about 5,000 feet. And we just got the, somebody asking a question. We just got the bird's eye view lens. So this is what the observatory looks like when the roof rolls up, rolls off right as the sun is setting. And our telescope is this guy right over here on the side, the, the 24 incher. And this is the kind of work that the scope can do. So as your interest grows, in the club here in astrophotography and astro video we can talk about ways that you can get access to some of these almost miraculous views that we can now get with amateur equipment but i really wanted to show you something pretty interesting this is a long set of exposures of an object you guys are familiar with some of you at least from out of the observatory the lagoon nebula messier 8 in sagittarius and this is about 40 hours of total exposure to the, all the different filters to create the color image as well as the luminance. And it, it came out spectacularly well. And yet this is the same object taken from my home setup with a 12 inch telescope and a ZWO astro video camera and only about two hours of exposure total time. It's like, it's like six times 20 minute exposures. And this is something that comes up very well on the club's uh, C14 with a ZWO camera also set up to do our astro video presentations. So the point I wanted to make is, yeah, you can go off the deep end like I do and go down to Chile with remote, but you can also do the same thing from New Jersey. And you know, it may not be as good, but it's close. And it's pretty darn interesting what we can do with the equipment at, at our hands. Of course, in the end of the day, the Chilean exposures going very, very deep are going to blow us away because that's what it's all about down there. The incredible seeing and the deep sky objects that you can only access from the southern hemisphere. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Emily Levesque. She's a professor of astronomy at the University of Washington. Her presentation is entitled The Last Stargazers, which is a behind the scenes tour of life as a professional astronomer. Uh, her research explores how the most massive stars in the universe evolve and die. She's observed using some of the most powerful telescopes in the world and has experienced engaging true stories and collected tall tales of the adventures and misadventures that accompany our exploration of the universe. Uh, we'll learn how professional astronomers collect data using world-class telescopes, meet the people who run them, and explore the crucial role of human curiosity in the past, present, and future of scientific discovery. Uh, the Last Stargazers is based on her critically acclaimed popular science book with the same title. A uh, few words about Professor Levesque. She earned her undergraduate degree in physics from MIT, her PhD in astronomy from the University of Hawaii. She has observed for upwards of 50 nights on many of the world's largest telescopes. Her research has taken her into the Antarctic stratosphere in an experimental aircraft. 
Her academic accolades include the 2014 Annie Jump Cannon Award, a 2017 Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, a 2019 Cottrell Scholar Award, and the 2020 Newton Lacey Pierce Prize. So with that, I welcome Professor Levesque. All right, thank you so much for having me and for inviting me to speak tonight. So as described, my talk tonight is going to focus on this sort of behind the scenes look at what it's actually like to be a professional astronomer and what we actually do all day or all night, depending on who you ask. And this in turn is based on the popular science book that I wrote that explores these questions for a general audience and kind of welcomes people to the world of professional astronomy. And when I was working on this book, this was actually my first sort of foray into writing for a popular audience and my first real experience with the publishing world. And just before the pandemic started to close things down, I got to go to a library conference and speak with other authors and serve on panels and talk about books all day. It was amazing. And one topic that kept coming up was the first lines of books and how books open. And we can think of famous first lines of books all the time. You can imagine, you know, call me Ishmael or it was a dark and stormy night and these just beautiful opening lines that really set the stage for what a book is going to be about. And it got me thinking about what the first line of my book is. And Victor actually already told you, my book opens with the brilliant, inspiring phrase, have you tried turning it off and on again? And it sounds ridiculous, but I have a really good reason for this, because this is one of the most petrifying things that's ever been said to me at a telescope. Somebody asked me this while I was sitting here. So I was observing at the Subaru telescope, a Katap Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and Subaru has a 8.2 meter mirror. Um, for scale, this is me standing under another very similarly sized mirror, the 8.1 meter at Gemini. And you can see just how absolutely enormous this mirror is, what an amazing undertaking it is to observe with one of these telescopes and how sophisticated and you know complicated you'd imagine an instrument like this to be. So I was in the midst of observing at this telescope when one of the computers in the room with me made this terrible just sort of blunk sound. And I remember looking over at it and then looking at the telescope operator in the room. And she also gave the computer the sort of sideways glance and then looked at me and said, oh, don't worry about that. I think the mirror is still on the telescope. And I'm sure she meant this to be reassuring, but I didn't realize it was an option for the mirror to not be on the telescope. So I asked her what she meant. And her explanation was that the blunk was an alarm saying that the mechanical supports holding up the telescope's secondary had just stopped working. And we had supposedly gotten lucky with how the telescope was positioned and we were pointed nearly straight up. And as a reminder of the scale of things when you're dealing with telescopes this big, the primary secondary orientation is just like your familiar backyard Cassegrain, where the secondary, and in this case we have the Palomar 200 inch telescope sort of serving as our stunt double, the secondary is that cylinder you see at the top of the screen. It's suspended high above the primary and high above the floor of the observatory and is intended to, you know, stay there. And what we'd been warned was that since these supports had failed, we were at risk if we tipped the telescope from side to side of dumping that secondary onto the floor. This was something like a 400 pound piece of glass. If we were lucky, it would smash into the concrete floor. And presumably that was the crash we would have heard. This is how she explained that she knew the mirror was still on the telescope. If it wasn't, we would have heard a crash. If we were unlucky, that secondary would hit the primary mirror on the way down. And I was then left with trying to decide what to do. And we called the day crew at the observatory. They informed us that that blunk we'd heard was probably a false alarm. The mechanical supports were probably okay. The secondary was probably gonna stay on the telescope and we could probably fix the whole thing. There was far too much probably going on. We could probably fix the whole thing by turning the telescope off and on again, like a modem, which didn't seem like the right treatment for a building sized piece of equipment. I was 24 years old and tasked with making this decision because I was the lead scientist carrying out the observations. And all that was spinning through my head was all the stories that I'd heard of other times things had gone horribly wrong at telescopes. And the one that stood in my mind the most was this telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia. So this is the beautiful 
former radio telescope at Green Bank, which was 300 feet from end to end. It got some of the best early radio observations that our field had seen until one evening when it went from this to this. And at the time, sitting at Subaru, I was sure that this had happened because someone had tried turning it off and on again. So I sat at Subaru, posed with this challenge of trying to keep observing and risk damaging the telescope, or to call it a night and risk losing one of the only nights I had on this big, beautiful telescope to get critical data for my thesis. And I wasn't entirely sure what to do. And this is the story that I used to open the book. And it gives people a glimpse of just how high stakes things can get at these huge facilities, just how precious a night of observing time is and how loath we are to give it up if something only might be wrong. And it offers that behind the scenes look at what we do for our jobs. So the motivation behind the book was that it's not really hard to sell people on space being cool. You see these gorgeous pictures from Hubble or Subaru or any of the really beautiful um, professional and amateur photos that we're able to get all the time and people love looking at them. But what they know less about is the story behind where these pictures come from and the story of what professional astronomy is actually like. If you ask a random person to describe what they think a professional astronomer does, they will probably picture something like this. They'll probably picture an astronomer, a man, in a lab coat, for some reason he's got a beard, um, standing next to a little telescope that he's peering through with his eye and sort of taking notes with. And it's a fair picture because this is the sort of backyard astronomy that a lot of people have probably experienced. They just sort of imagine scaling this up to picture what a professional career in astronomy is like. And the reality is pretty different, but it's not a reality that a lot of people get exposed to. And these aren't stories that a lot of people get to hear. I was definitely in this boat when I was little. I did not have to get sold on space. Um, that's me at age six, proudly sporting my Hubble Space Telescope t-shirt. That was the year that Hubble launched. Um, my brother calls my facial expression here, what do you mean four, six year olds can't use Hubble? Um, so I knew that space was fascinating. I knew that I wanted to be an astronomer, but I didn't know any professional scientists. I had no idea what being a professional scientist would entail. We had a great little backyard telescope that we would take out occasionally and that I would use with my dad. And it gave me a little glimpse of what observing was like. But even as a kid, I knew this probably wasn't exactly what my job would be if I did this professionally one day. Not growing up in an area with scientists and not knowing anybody with a PhD or who did science or astronomy for a career, I was mostly left with the movies that were coming out while I was growing up to give me a glimpse of what professional science would be like. And according to the movies that I saw, I learned that your science spends a lot of time chasing you, as in the case of Twister or Jurassic Park. I also got the sense that even if you did become an astronomer, you probably didn't discover aliens every day like they did in Contact. So I was a little bit at a loss as to what my job would entail until halfway through my undergraduate time at MIT. After my sophomore year, I traveled out to Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona to start a summer research project working with who, someone who is now a close colleague of mine to this day, Philip Massey. And we went to Kitt Peak to observe for five nights and study red supergiants. So the evolved descendants of very massive stars sort of nearing the ends of their lives before they die as supernovae and make things like neutron stars or black holes. So we showed up at this observatory and it was my first time visiting a professional observatory and my first time doing any professional observing. We went into the cafeteria and we sat down for dinner that first night at a table full of astronomers. And Phil introduced me to everybody by saying, hi, this is Emily Levesque. She's doing her first night of observing. This is her first time at a telescope. And everybody went, oh, that's great. That's so cool. Now, remember to order your night lunch. This is the meal that we all bring up to eat in the middle of the night. And they say, but don't eat it too early. You'll get hungry at 10 p.m. Try to hold off until the middle of the night. And they'll say, remember to drink coffee, but stop drinking coffee around 2 or 3 a.m. or else you'll never get to sleep. And the stories went on. They said, you know, keep an eye on the floor. We have scorpions here. I know a woman who had a scorpion crawl up the inside of her pant leg and sting her while she was observing, which is true. And then someone else said, well, that's nothing. I know a guy who had a raccoon crawl into his lap while he was observing. And he just sort of petted until it went to sleep. And then someone else said, well, I know a guy who was observing when lightning struck the dome while he was working. And the stories just kept coming. 
And I remember sitting there with my spoon, like stuck halfway to my mouth, unable to keep eating because I was so engrossed by the stories. And I couldn't decide if I wanted to run off to the telescope and immediately get my own stories or just sit and listen to these tales all night. And it took me a while later on to realize what that had really been about, that this sort of storytelling and this sort of passing around of tall tales and adventures was that group's way of kind of welcoming me to the field and saying, well, this is what our job is like. This is what you've got in store. These are some of the wacky things that can happen when working in a place like this. And that welcome really stuck with me and became the motivation for The Last Stargazers. It tells those same kinds of stories, the stories that astronomers like to pass around each other, and uses them to give readers a behind the scenes look at what life is like as a professional astronomer. And it uses the stories to also drive the science behind what we do, understanding why we go out to observatories in the middle of nowhere, or why mirrors need to be so big, why one night of time on a telescope can be critically important. And with all of that context, it helps people learn more about astronomy as well as about astronomers themselves and how they work. So I'll, I'll put these details up again later for folks who are interested in the book. But the adventure that I had once this idea had sort of come to be was actually putting together my research and writing the book. And I got to take all sorts of fascinating trips in pursuit of stories and science for this book. And I got to go to places like the odd location you see on the upper left. Um, I'm sporting a great hairdo and some great glasses. Those are actually laser safety glasses because I'm standing in the middle of the Gravitational Wave Observatory in Eastern Washington State in the central room where the lasers that help measure gravitational waves are actually ignited and then processed. I got to visit places like the Flying Observatory Sophia, which I'll talk about more in a moment, and go back to places like the summit of Mauna Kea or historical observatories like Palomar. But I think the best part of all of this research is the picture on the lower right, which might not look that exciting, but that was my trusty little voice recorder for the interviews that I conducted with over 100 of my colleagues. I sat down with as many astronomers as I could and just said, tell me your best observing stories. And I'm not a trained investigative journalist. I learned how to conduct these interviews and how to get people talking and storytelling on the fly. And I largely just let people talk and tell me their stories. But there were a few questions that I liked to ask everybody because I wanted to get a consistent set of answers that I could put together into the overall narrative arc of the book. And those are the three stories that I'll be answering in my presentation here tonight. So the first thing that I always liked to ask people was what's your most memorable sort of second or third or 10th hand observing story? People were great at telling me about things that had happened to them. But what I wanted to hear were the stories that were absolutely kind of half true. They'd heard somebody else's advisor tell somebody else's postdoc a story at a conference about this guy they knew, but it was just so memorable that they had to share it, even if it wasn't entirely reliable. I was interested in finding these stories that had sort of entered into the legendarium of the field and the tall tales that had grown minds of their own so that I could hopefully track down the true stories and then put them in this book. And there were two different answers that kept coming up for this. By far the most popular answer is another story that Victor alluded to, which was, do you have the one about the telescope that got shot? I can't tell you how many people asked me this or gave me some wild variation on this story. This was in fact a true story, and it happened at McDonald Observatory, as pointed out in Texas, though the Texans that I tell this story to will all point out that the person with the gun in this story was actually a recent transplant from Ohio. They're all very, very emphatic on this point. But what happened was at McDonald, this 107 inch telescope had been at the time newly built, and it was like the crown jewel of the mountain, this big, beautiful, new, large telescope. Now at the observatory was an observatory crew member who, according to different accounts, was disturbed or under the influence 
and this crew member got hell-bent on destroying this telescope one evening. Now, if you ask different astronomers about this story, they'll give you a bunch of different answers. They'll say, oh, the gunman was involved in some sort of spurned lover incident at the observatory, or is a grad student who was angry at their advisor, or it was this famously prickly observer that nobody liked to work with. But it was an observatory staff member. He went charging into the control room of this telescope in the middle of an evening, pointed the gun at the operator and demanded that the telescope be lowered so that he could destroy it. And the operator did as asked. Fortunately, nobody was hurt in this incident. And the gunman then looked down the barrel of the telescope at that big, beautiful 107 inch mirror, and he emptied the clip of the handgun into the mirror, shooting seven bullets into it. And it sounds horrifying. It sounds like a way to absolutely decimate a telescope. But you have to think about what 107 inch mirror is like. These mirrors are poured from borosilicate glass. So it's the same kind of glass that's in a Pyrex dish that you have at home. And the glass is about a foot and a half thick for a telescope like the 107 inch. So imagine a foot and a half thick piece of Pyrex and then imagine a bullet landing in it. The bullets basically just went and landed in the glass of the telescope like darts being thrown into a dartboard. They embedded in the glass, nothing else shattered, and they just sort of sat there. The gunman was very disappointed in this result. He had hoped to destroy this telescope in a fit of anger. He grabbed a hammer. He started climbing down the telescope to go after the mirror. And at this point, he was subdued and taken away. And the observatory staff then peered in and got a look at what damage the bullets had done. And I think the collective decision was, oh, it's not that bad. They were able to dig out the bullets, paint over the damaged holes so that the reflections wouldn't bounce around, and then just keep observing. The description was this had gone from a 107 inch telescope to a 106 inch telescope. So it really was still working fine. And the only problem was that word got out into the community about this incident. As part of, you know, a gunman running around the observatory, the local sheriff was called to the scene. The sheriff looked at the same view that you have in front of you right now, saw the same thing you're seeing and said, oh my God, the telescope's been destroyed because he was looking at the big hole in the center of the telescope, which folks familiar with telescope design know is there on purpose. It's the hole designed so that you can focus light from the secondary back down to the Cassegrain focus and back to a camera or instrument or whatever you put back there. The sheriff didn't know that. Presumably he thought the gunman was, I don't know, shooting a bazooka or something to make this giant hole. And he then put out word, you know, oh, this telescope was absolutely destroyed in this incident. And that started circulating in the astronomy community. So the director of the observatory at the time, Harlan J. Smith, put out an announcement saying, the harm suffered by the mirror from his bullets and the preliminary blows with the hammer was extraordinarily small. Now, he put out this announcement in a bulletin that normally shares things like, oh, there's a new Nova in M31, someone should really look at that. Or, hey, we've got new observations of a variable star. So switching to the harm from the bullets was extraordinarily small was quite a change in tone and most definitely put this down in people's memories as one of the more dramatic incidents to happen at a telescope. So. This is a wacky telescope story, but there's actually a surprising amount of science embedded in here as well for readers of a story like this. For starters, you have to understand why the telescope is called the 107 inch. Why are those big primary mirrors so important? Why do we so often refer to telescopes just by the size of that mirror? People need to understand that those primaries are huge to gather the really faint starlight that we're trying to study. The gunman started this story by pointing his gun at the telescope operator. So a reader would need to understand what a telescope operator does and why an operator specially trained to run one of these telescopes is different from the astronomer who might be doing research. You need to know how thick that mirror is so you get why the bullets didn't shatter the glass. You need to know what the big Cassegrain hole is for so you don't make the same mistake as the sheriff. And you need to understand how precious big telescopes are because you might wonder, well, how big of a deal is it to damage one telescope? How many big telescopes are there in the world? It turns out not that many. So this is not just a sort of wacky, exciting story. It's a story that to be told properly requires that the audience really know a lot about telescopes and about what professional astronomy is like. So it becomes a great story told about halfway through the book once people have the background that they need to really understand the impact of a tale like this.
So do you have the one about the telescope that got shot was one of my most common answers. The other thing that a lot of people tended to ask was, okay, what about those mysterious radio bursts? I heard about this thing in Australia. Somebody thought they detected aliens and it turned out they detected something funny. What, what was that? And people had sort of half memories of this story. This was a story that happened pretty recently at Parkes Observatory in Australia, and it began around 2007. The main Parkes radio telescope, so the gorgeous antenna that you see on screen right now, detected this weird bright flash of radio emission coming from somewhere. They couldn't tell what had produced it. It was a pretty brief burst. They had never seen anything like it before. It was sort of tagged as, oh, that's one of those the strange new burst of radio light, and we don't know what that means. Years later, an astronomer named Emily Petroff arrived at Parks for graduate research, and she was really interested in trying to get to the bottom of what this weird burst of radio light could be. And she asked if this was something she could pursue for her research. And the folks working at the observatory immediately said, oh no, don't bother. Turns out we detect things like that all the time. It's probably not anything real. It's probably not astronomy. It's probably just something on the ground or some local source of radio interference that's messing with the telescope. And it seemed like a nice, convenient explanation, but Emily wasn't quite convinced. And she was very interested in getting to the bottom of what these weird events actually were. They'd been given the nickname Peritons, which is this mythical creature that looks like one thing, but casts the shadow of something else. This idea of, oh, these look like cool events from deep space. They're probably just local interference. And Emily wanted to disentangle whether these really were local like sort of interfering bits of electronics are similar, or whether they might be real events worth looking into. So she rounded up everybody at the observatory. The entire observatory staff actually eventually became co-authors on her research paper, and they set about trying to make a periton on purpose and trying to explain where these things could have come from. And their first hint came when they looked at when peritons happened. They tended to cluster around the lunchtime hour. Now, space is weird, but space does not care when lunchtime is in Australia. So this was the first hint as to what was going on. So if you look at this sort of aerial shot of parks, you'll see that there are three administrative buildings on site near this big main telescope. And those buildings have offices, they have break rooms, they have places where people can sort of heat up lunch or heat up a snack in one of the facility microwaves. And looking at the frequency of these bursts, they thought, well, the microwaves might be to blame. So they tried to reproduce a periton. And it didn't work. The microwaves weren't making peritons. Now, they were so careful about how they did this. They ran the microwaves on high and low power. They tried different durations. They microwave a ceramic mug full of water every time. They very carefully document this in the research paper. Some poor soul read like the entire manual for a 70s era microwave to figure out exactly how they worked. And they weren't producing peritons. The antenna wasn't detecting anything at all, no matter how they ran the micro microwaves. And it took them sort of pausing and saying, well, we're doing this like very conscientious and careful scientists. What if we microwave something like somebody who's hungry and anxious for their food? Because we've all done this. When you microwave popcorn or when you heat up leftovers, you're standing in front of the microwave and you're watching it count down and you're seeing it go four, three, two, close enough. And you open the door, you know you do it, before the microwave is quite done. Now, when they tried doing this, when they opened the microwave door before it had quite finished running, that did it. They were able to produce a periton. They got this little blast of radio emission from a microwave opened mid-run. And this, when they went back to the data, explained the radio bursts that they had been detecting for years from this telescope, with one exception. The burst from 2007 was not a periton. It could not be explained by a microwave being opened early. That burst was actually real, and it became one of the canonical examples of a phenomenon we now know as a fast radio burst. Now, Emily is still working on these today. There are tons of people devoting heaps of telescope time to understanding what fast radio bursts are and where they come from, and we're still not certain. But none of this would have happened if we hadn't started by sort of rediscovering microwaves with these telescopes and clearing out the bad data so we could focus on the really exciting science.
So this was another variant of story that a lot of people told me. The discovered microwaves were the most famous, but there are several great examples of telescopes that sort of accidentally discover something that you wouldn't expect. Radio telescopes tend to be the biggest culprits here because it is so easy to detect errant radio emission from things on the ground. If you had radio eyesight right now and just looked around the room you're sitting in, you'd be seeing a buzz of Wi-Fi networks. If you have fluorescent lights, you'd be seeing a little flicker of fluorescent lights. If a car is driving past, you'd see little flashes of uh, radio emission from the um, spark plugs in the engine. So there's radio emission all over the place. And some observatories do a great job of trying to avoid this. The new beautiful rebuilt telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia is a wonderful example because it sits at the center of the National Radio Quiet Zone. So this is an area of West Virginia where they ban microwaves and Wi-Fi and cell phones. Um, any cars there actually run on diesel rather than traditional combustion engines, so you don't get those little sparks. They try so hard to keep this observatory as quiet as possible and free of radio interference. And even this observatory has run into trouble. One of my favorite stories from there was that not too long ago, some researchers were working in the beautiful state forest around Green Bank, and they were studying a tiny endangered species of flying squirrel. And to study these squirrels and how they worked and how they traveled and moved around, they decided the best thing to do would be to fit the squirrels with little radio collars, which meant that they then unleashed this adorable swarm of radio interference sources. They effectively shut down the observatory for a couple of months. They were not detecting anything but squirrels. They wound up taking the time to do some engineering improvements while they waited for the batteries and the little collars to die. So mm. even in one of the ra most radio quiet places on the planet, you can sometimes wind up detecting a squirrel instead of the mysteries of the universe. Even um, gravitational wave astronomy isn't immune from these kinds of stories. This is the gravitational wave detector out in eastern Washington, here in Washington state. And these observatories, in brief, work by firing lasers down the two perfectly straight, long arms that you see in this picture. Those two arms are vacuum tubes with extremely heavy mirrors suspended at the ends. And by firing mirrors, back, firing lasers back and forth along those um, arms, they can effectively measure the arm length to astonishingly perfect precision and pick up any tiny shift in the length of the arm that comes from a gravitational wave passing through Earth. The fact that they can detect this at all is stunning. The size of a gravitational wave on average is about one one thousandth the width of a proton. But the challenge with an observatory like this isn't detecting that, it's not detecting everything else. They've gone to great lengths to make sure that this observatory doesn't detect earthquakes or rain hitting the ground or trucks driving by on the highway or waves hitting the Pacific shore 200 miles away, but they can't quite protect against everything. They, a few years back, started getting these weird sporadic signals showing up in the detector and a constant signal from rain or a predictable signal from trucks were all things that they were familiar with, but there were these little occasional bursts or flashes that looked like signal, but they knew they weren't gravitational waves. They looked at the data and they finally were able to get to the bottom of what they were detecting. They were detecting a raven pecking at the ice that had accumulated on the cooling, cooling equipment on the outside of these tubes. And there was a whole careful write-up where they get a photo of the culprit and they name him Thirsty the Raven. They go inspect the ice and they see sort of raven beak shaped holes in the ice. They get a grad student with a hammer to go pretend to be a raven and tap on the ice and they do indeed produce the same signal. So even a gravitational wave facility can fall prey to these sort of accidental discussions and mistake a bird for a black hole. So these are some of the great tall tale, well-remembered stories that people loved to tell me. Another question that I liked to ask was what my colleagues thought would surprise people the most about our jobs. What did they think was sort of the biggest contrast between what people think astronomers do and what we actually do? And I got a mix of answers to this. Um, one was, you know, we don't really look through eyepieces professionally anymore. But the 
bigger sort of takeaway from that wasn't just, well, we don't do our work with eyepieces anymore. It's we do our work in some really surprising ways now. We have some pretty stunning adventures as part of doing our jobs. And I think anytime somebody pictures a scientist, they picture, again, a white lab coat. They presumably picture a lot of time spent in a lab or hunched over a computer. And our jobs certainly do have a lot of computer time and a lot of patient waiting or a lot of pouring through data. But the lab coat picture isn't quite right for a lot of astronomy. The job is a little less white lab coat and a little more Indiana Jones. And you rarely get to see a scene like this. And I got a great list of sort of adventures or amazing places or wild scenes that people told me as part of their work. Now, I will admit that on the lower right, there is a man in a white lab coat standing next to a little telescope. He has an excuse because that is the coolest telescope we've ever built, and I'll get to why in just a second. But beginning on the upper left, one of the wonderful and most adventurous telescopes that I learned about in my research was this one, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA. So SOFIA is an infrared telescope built into the back of a specially modified Boeing 747. And it's designed to fly up into the stratosphere, so at about 45,000 feet above where commercial planes fly, and then open the door that you see in the rear of the plane. This exposes the infrared telescope at altitudes where you're above most of the planet's water vapor. It lets us detect infrared wavelengths that would normally be eaten up by clouds and other water vapor before ever making it to a ground-based telescope. I got the chance to visit this telescope and interview pilots and crew members. I also got the chance to fly on this telescope for my research, studying red supergiants and studying sort of the end stages of massive stars. We got to go down to New Zealand, fly the plane out of Christchurch for a Southern Hemisphere deployment. We actually flew so close to Antarctica that we were able to see the Southern Aurora out the window of the plane. It is probably the best adventure I've ever gotten to have in my life as a professional astronomer. And the fact that we fly telescopes in the backs of planes tends to really surprise people, but it's a nice glimpse of the lengths that we'll go to to try and get the data that we need. I also talked to a lot of astronomers who are solar astronomers or who go on solar eclipse expeditions. Now they will carry all of the research equipment that they will need to get a handful of precious minutes of observations during a complete solar eclipse so they can study the solar corona, so they can study the composition of the outer layers of the sun and get new observations in the magnetic field of the sun. But these expeditions mean taking yourself and your crew and your colleagues and your gear all over the planet. This particular picture is from the 2015 solar eclipse that went, so totality passed over Svalbard in Norway. And my colleague telling me this story explained that when their crew arrived, they were told that they needed to get polar bear safety training because where they were was in an area that had a very high amount of polar bear traffic. And a couple of them were experienced hikers and said, oh, are you, are you going to give us bear spray? And they were instead walked out to a shooting range. So it gives you a sense of scale of just, you know, how dangerous polar bears can be and some of the unexpected surprises that face teams like this when they take these experts expeditions all over the world for these observations. I also got to talk to people who do things like balloon astronomy or rocket astronomy. So this is like the airplane astronomy taken to another level, literally. They'll build detectors or build telescopes and send them aloft on balloons, or they'll shoot them up on suborbital rockets that will give them maybe five minutes of observing time above Earth's atmosphere. But that's all that they'll need sometimes to get a glimpse of some high energy light that you can't normally get from the ground. To launch these balloons or rockets, they'll travel to places like the South Pole. They'll travel to remote corners of Australia or missile ranges that generally are only occupied by sort of very classified work. So these adventures similarly took people all over the planet in search of their data. I talked to people who visited the South Pole, not just to launch balloons, but to work at the South Pole Telescope. This is one of the telescopes that was involved in taking our famous first image of a black hole. And the astronomers who worked there described wintering over in Antarctica, working with data that they then had to sort of ship back 
to processing facilities in the form of enormous sort of data tapes so that they could eventually process it. And just the adventure of working in wintertime in Antarctica was a whole story on its own. And then finally, I promised I would explain why this photo on the right is so amazing. So the astronomer in the white lab coat here is a man named George Carruthers. And he is the inventor of the ultraviolet camera. He basically created the technology that makes it possible for us to capture ultraviolet photographs. And one of the first places that he used this technology was in the design of this little telescope that you see in the picture. And it's a tiny little four inch ultraviolet telescope designed to sit on a very sturdy tripod. But this is the only telescope that we have ever operated from the surface of the moon. It flew aboard Apollo 16 and astronauts John Young and Charlie Duke operated it for several days and got the first ultraviolet astronomy images that we have. They observed our own planet. They got pictures of the aurora at the Earth's poles. They got some of the early ultraviolet photos of Milky Way stars. And it strikes me as, you know, the farthest we've ever taken a telescope like this in the traditional sense, and certainly the farthest we've ever taken a telescope that sits on the ground. When I was putting my book together, I realized I had to limit the types of stories I could tell because otherwise it would be three books. And I decided I would focus on ground-based astronomy. And as you can see from the plane and the balloon and this moon-based telescope, I got a little cute with the definition of ground, but I maintain that the balloons and airplanes start and end on the ground. And George Carruthers' telescope certainly was on some ground. The ground just happened to be the moon. So they got waved into the stories that were told in the book. A lot of the adventures that people shared with me focused on sort of just grappling with the challenges of our own planet. And one of the best stories I heard along these lines actually happened right here in Washington State at a little observatory called Manastash Ridge Observatory. So Manastash Ridge is down in sort of southern central Washington State, and it's operated by the University of Washington. And for years, it was a favorite telescope of our graduate students. They could go there and get really beautiful observations for their thesis research. And the story that happened at Manastash Ridge happened to one of our UW graduate students. His name was Doug Geisler, and he was there getting the first night of observations for his PhD thesis. And as a good observer, he took very careful notes in the observatory's night log that are still preserved today. So you can go to the observatory and see his night log notes that describe a gorgeous night of observing on May 18th, 1980. And when I tell this story in Washington, a lot of people immediately recognize that date. But if you don't, it'll become very clear what happened on that day soon. He had a wonderful night of observing. You'll see that he takes notes. He observed for 10 hours. He didn't lose any time. Hours lost to zero. The sky condition was excellent. He had exquisite conditions and was able to get great observations of some young stars in the globular cluster. He went to bed ready to probably wake up around noon the next day and have another gorgeous night of observing. Now, when I talked to Doug about this story, he remembered waking up at about 8 or 9 a.m. that morning because he thought he'd heard something. And he couldn't even really tell what it was. There'd just been sort of this distant noise that caught his attention and he kind of went, oh, okay, it's too early to wake up in the middle of an observing run. And he went back to sleep. He then woke up again at noon, got up and started getting ready for the day. He was alone and the only person at the observatory. And he opened the dormitory door, sort of step out and go visit the telescope. And he opened the door at noon to a just black scene in front of him. He couldn't see more than an arm's length in front of him. When he grabbed a flashlight, the flashlight beam just got swallowed by black air. There was this awful sort of brimstone sour smell in the air. He had no idea what he was facing. He thought that they, we had just undergone a nuclear attack. He thought the world was ending. He ran back indoors, grabbed a radio, and started trying to find a news station that could explain what had happened. And he finally learned what he was standing in the middle of. Because earlier that morning, Mount St. Helens had erupted. And Mount St. Helens was about 90 miles southwest of Manastash Ridge Observatory. And the way Mount St. Helens eruption actually happened was the side of the mountain effectively blew off. And that sideways explosion combined with the winds that day blew the huge plume of volcanic smoke and ash directly to the northeast. So you can see where the eruption is. You can see where Doug was. And you can see exactly what he was standing in when he opened the door of the observatory that moment. So he 
like a good astronomer, took some notes in the night log about what had happened. For the following night, he noted that he had lost six hours, and the reason was a volcano. The sky condition was black and smelly. He described what it was like to slowly figure out what had happened, and then noted that he did carefully go out and cover the telescope and instruments to protect them from the falling ash because it was starting to settle through the slit of the dome. Now, this log entry has now passed into astronomy legend and is passed around here in the Pacific Northwest. And Doug's careful description of what had happened that night actually lent my book the title for its fourth chapter, which is Hours Lost, Six Reasons Volcano. And it explores some of the natural challenges that astronomers face when working at these observatories out in the middle of nowhere. You'll also note the title for chapter five, The Harm from the Bullets Was Extraordinarily Small, which is a story you've already heard. So the last question that I always asked my colleagues was how astronomy had changed since they began observing. I spoke to colleagues who had been observing for six decades. They had begun observing in the early 1950s when you used photographic plates to capture images and had gone straight through digital observing. I'd spoken to people who'd really seen every possible shift and change that our fields experienced in close to the past century. And those technological shifts were what most people identified. They primarily pointed to what this meant for how we actually got and captured and preserved and analyzed our data. Now, working with these photographic plates was an amazing challenge all on its own because observers would go to mountains and usually work with plates that had been ordered from a company like Kodak. They would arrive in sort of big boxes and they would then slice the plates down to the exact size needed for whatever camera they were working with at the mountain. These plates were chemically treated with a silver halide solution that would darken when exposed to light, but it usually didn't darken fast enough to deal with the very dim signals coming from a faraway galaxy. So astronomers would bake the plates or freeze them. They would spray them with ammonia. There were some infrared plates that were actually treated with hydrogen gas. One astronomer swore by lemon juice and just rubbing lemons all over the plates. They would try every trick they could to make them respond as quickly as possible to this dim light that they were trying to study. In some cases, they would actually have to bend the plates a little bit so that they would fit into the slightly curved back end of a camera with a curved focal plane. They would do all of this work, by the way, in the dark, because once you started exposing these plates to light, they became useless for the research they were trying to do. So they would work on these plates for hours. They would carry these delicate plates out to the telescope. They would climb up into, in some cases, the prime focus of the telescope, so suspended high above the floor. And then they would load these plates into and out of cameras all night, hoping that you didn't break one or hoping that the right side of the plate that was properly chemically treated was the one facing forward. Astronomers actually got into the habit of licking or tapping their lips to plates to try and feel the sticky side that had silver halide on it. A few of them weren't sure that eating silver halide was good for them, but it was the only way that they could work with these plates in the middle of the night. They would expose them for hours and then bring them back in, take them into a dark room and process the plates immediately, all to get images like this. Now, it sounds like an immensely arduous process, but look at the beautiful image that you're able to get as a result. This is the galaxy NGC 6946. It's one of my favorite galaxies because it's hosted 10 core collapse supernovae in the past 100 years. And you can see every detail of this galaxy. You can see bright foreground stars. You can see knots of star formation. You can see signs of the dust lanes in the galactic arms and just this beautiful little color negative image of this great galaxy. So these observations were arduous, but they did produce beautiful science. Everybody that I interviewed who had observed with plates loved telling me about plates, but none of them missed working with plates because now with digital detectors, you can get an image that looks less like this and more like this of the exact same galaxy. And that's NGC 6946 observed with Subaru, the telescope I was at at the very beginning of this story. So you can see the exquisite amount of detail that we're now able to get much more quickly, much more efficiently, and with digital data that can just be copied and pasted and worked on on a laptop instead of a plate that you're tenderly carrying down a mountain, hoping you won't break it. So these technological changes really have had a big effect on the kind of research that we do. 
They've also started to change what our jobs are as stargazers and what professional astronomy really looks like. One of the observatories that I visited during my research was the under construction Vera C. Rubin Observatory in Chile. It's named after, of course, the woman who discovered dark matter, and its observational mission is a really fascinating one because it's going to just survey the southern sky over and over again, taking pictures of the southern sky every few nights for 10 years. And that's effectively going to give us a decade long movie of the southern sky. We'll be able to see any star that gets brighter or dimmer. We'll be able to see the little flash of an appearing supernova. We'll see an asteroid sort of scooting through from frame to frame as it travels across the sky. And it's going to be amazing for detecting things that change with time, this sort of field of time domain astronomy. So it's setting a new benchmark for the volume of data and the type of data that we're able to get. But the observations at Rubin Observatory are also kind of unusual because astronomers won't go to this telescope and sit there and direct it from night to night because it has a preset pattern of observations that it will do. There will be a telescope operator there. There will be maybe one or two people on site for safety or other operations. And that'll be it. The telescope will almost be a ghost town. It'll be taking data for astronomers, but it'll be taking pre-planned data that we then work with later. It's an amazing and efficient way of doing astronomy, and it's an amazing way to discover some strange things that change in the night sky, but it also can't work alone. We can't only do astronomy going forward with these types of observations. And my final example of this actually looks at one of my favorite discoveries that I've gotten to make. So a few years ago, my colleagues and I started studying these strange stars known as thorn Zhitkov objects. So they were predicted by Kip Thorne and Anna Zhitkov back in the 1970s, and they are effectively a star inside a star. These are stars that from the outside look like normal red supergiants. They look similar to Betelgeuse. But deep in the star's interior, instead of a core supported by nuclear fusion, so fusing helium into carbon, they're supported by quantum degeneracy pressure. They're supported by effectively a tiny neutron star that's been swallowed by the red supergiant and spiraled in to replace its core. The illustration here shows what we think it would look like while a TZO is forming. So they had predicted these stars years ago, but they were just sort of a theory for a very long time. People had looked for them or tried to imagine what they might look like, but nobody had ever successfully found one. And it's understandable why this was so hard. They look just like normal red supergiants. The idea that a neutron star is embedded in the center of the star is actually very hard to test. And it took a lot of careful work before we finally came up with an idea for how to look like these. It turns out that that central neutron star can do very strange things to the chemistry deep in the star's interior. And those cold outer layers of the star would actually stir that chemistry up to the surface of the star. So you'd find a star with sort of weird, unusual element enhancements that you'd never expect to see in a normal star, but that could be made by this weird structure of a thorn Jitgav object. So we had been working on red supergiants, my colleagues and I, for a long time, and then Anna Zhitkov emailed us and said, have you ever thought about checking to see if some of your red supergiants might be Thorn Zhitkov objects? We hadn't. We learned about these stars and thought that they sounded fascinating. And then we had to design an observing program for a telescope that could actually find these. And you couldn't find an object like a Thorn Zhitkov object just from watching the brightness of something change. You couldn't just do this with a survey of the night sky. We actually had to hand pick stars that we thought might be likely candidates and take very close looks at them. We wound up doing this at the Magellan telescopes in Chile, which at the time you could still only observe with by flying down to them and working in person. So we flew down with a list of stars. We were revising that list up until the moment the dome opened. And we then carefully looked at the spectrum of a bunch of stars in the Milky Way and then in the Magellanic Clouds. So our galaxy's little satellite galaxies. We gathered the star's light. We effectively sorted it out according to its wavelength. And we did this in a very fine grained manner so that we could identify any little spots of color where the star was either absorbing extra light or admitting extra light. This actually gets at one of the funny frustrations of working as a professional astronomer, because I showed you this beautiful artist rendition 
of what a thorn jigsaw object looks like. And I tend to work with artists' renditions because if I ever talk to a reporter and they ask me for a picture of my research, I just give them this because an actual image of my research coming straight off of a telescope looks a lot more like this. This is what a high resolution, very beautifully taken spectrum of a cold star looks like. As you look from the top to the bottom, you'll see those white stripes. Those are effectively going from blue to red and then blue to red and then blue to red over and over for every little piece of the star spectrum. Now, it looks like absolute gibberish when you just stare at it, but I had a colleague working with me at the telescope that night that was just sitting and watching the data come in. She was an expert observer and she had stared at data like this for so many years that she could instantly recognize key features of it as it came in. When this particular image popped up on screen in the middle of our night of observing, sitting at this telescope on a mountaintop in the middle of Chile, she immediately sat up, looked at the computer screen and said, I don't know what that is, but I know that I like it. And what she was noticing were these little bright white dots showing up here and there on the screen. We didn't know this at the time, but those dots turned out to be glowing hydrogen atoms in the atmosphere of a star. Now, normally red supergiants don't do that. In order to make hydrogen glow like this, you need an atmosphere that's very unstable and pulsing and actually driving shock waves out through the atmosphere that will excite these atoms. And that turned out to be much later when we were reanalyzing the data, a telltale sign of one star that actually was a thorn Zhitkov object. It had the same telltale strange chemistry and the same strange behavior in its atmosphere that told us that there must be a neutron star at its core. So this was an incredibly exciting discovery that we were able to make because we designed an observing program. We went to the telescope ourselves. This particular star only got on the list because one of my colleagues added it at the last minute right before the telescope opened. And we recognized it early on because we had an experienced observer with us who looked at the raw data and knew what she had seen. Now that we have a star like this, we would love to find more. And we're very interested in trying to find out how the brightness of these stars vary or what they might look like. So studying them with a facility like the Rubin Observatory would be amazing. But discovering a star like this with Rubin might not work. This is all a look at the sort of diversity of tools that we really need as stargazers and as professional astronomers. We need facilities like Rubin that can just survey enormous chunks of the night sky and alert us to strange stars to study. We also need observatories like the Magellan telescopes on the upper left where we can go and design specific programs to really look in detail at stars that we think might be strange. We need big observatories, little observatories. We need observatories that operate at different wavelengths, like the radio telescopes we talked about. We really need this full suite of tools to do the research that we are interested in and answer the scientific questions that we're trying to answer. So technology has really changed in astronomy. It's changed our jobs as a result, but it hasn't changed the questions we're trying to answer and the sort of rich variety of telescopes that we need to do this work. So on that note, I wanted to mention a couple brief things before I stop and take questions. Um, if you've liked hearing about some of the weird science and weird stories that I've shared during this talk, I actually recently filmed a series for the Great Courses called Great Heroes and Discoveries of Astronomy. It's a series of lectures that looks at the big astronomy discoveries of the past century and also shares the stories of the people who made those discoveries possible. So you can find it on their website. It's available via either streaming or DVD. And you can also find a lot of tales of sort of behind the scenes glimpses of professional astronomy in my book, The Last Stargazers. So you can read more about it at thelaststargazers.com or find it anywhere where you'd like to buy books. Um, I can highly recommend wherever your local bookstore might be. So. On that note, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And thank you very much again for having me. Oh. Uh, I'd like to start, if I may, just asking the question. You were talking about uh, how astronomy has changed for astronomers over the years, and you talk mainly about uh methods of detecting light what about the optics how have telescope optics changed over the years oh oh that's a great question um 
A couple big changes have been the scale of telescope mirror that we can build. So I showed that big 8.1 meter um, Gemini mirror, and we are now capable of mosaicing mirrors like that together, or sort of taking a honeycomb model where we can take little sort of hexagonal pieces of mirrors and sort of knit them together to make mirrors that are 20, 30, 40 meters from end to end. Um, adaptive optics has also really changed things. Um, the idea that we can make mirrors very, very thin and then use magnets to actuate and deform the mirrors to accommodate, account for deformations in the atmosphere are just incredible. We're able to take sharper pictures that are as sharp from the ground as Hubble can achieve from orbit. So the optics have just really changed the scale of telescopes that we can build and how sharp the images are. And that directly turns into us just seeing further. The fact that we can now observe the other end of the visible universe is constantly mind blowing. And we're getting better at this all the time. Along the same lines, has software changed in such a way that is allowing you to do things you weren't able to do a few years ago? Oh, absolutely. And the even the scale of just a few years ago is very accurate. Um, my One of my favorite interviews in the whole book was with uh, my colleague, George Wallerstein, and he unfortunately very recently passed away, but he was observing in the 1950s when there was no software to speak of. Um, and he still loved doing some of his research and some of his data analysis by hand. And you can do great pencil and paper astronomy, but he witnessed the entire development of computers that could help with astronomy and computers that could carry out calculations and then the advent of software and sometimes very adorable clunky fortran based software but it was all you needed and it did the job and this evolution meant that we could handle larger quantities of data we could do calculations faster and it again just changed the scale of astronomy that we could do i have students now who are using machine learning and who are basically using ai to do their research. And the challenges of working with data from somewhere like the Rubin Observatory involve the fact that we're getting, I think the amount of data we'll get from that is something like one petabyte of data a month. And the sheer scale of data that you're working with means that you have to take a statistical and algorithmic approach to the analyses rather than sort of churning it through usual software. So our computational tools have almost unrecognizably changed the type of astronomy we can do, and it's it's evolving as fast as we can keep up. Professor Lebeck, um, do you think that the, with the advent of the electronic assisted astronomy, more opportunities are open for amateurs to make significant scientific contributions? I think opportunities for amateur contributions are as as strong, if not stronger, than they've ever been, regardless of how um, electronic assistive observing winds up changing. Um, and it, it was really interesting to write and publish this book. Um, I finished writing the book in late 2019 and wrote about how rare remote observing is. And then of course the pandemic happened and a lot of observatories closed for months and then had to very rapidly figure out remote or electronic or sort of remotely operated or robotically operated observing. And it has changed the way that we observe, let alone the way that you can take observations. Like I, I know we saw at the beginning of this, um, event, the 24-inch um, telescope in Chile that can be remotely operated. This op makes telescopes accessible in a very different way. And it makes the ability to sort of be nimble with them and say, oh, wait, it's a good night. We got two hours. I have a star I want to observe. Really amazing. And in a case like that, the more people we have doing observing, and definitely including amateur observers on this list, the more science we're able to get. Um, I also, I have students who work with the AAVSO data all the time and work with the variable star data that observers put in. And it's still, in some cases, the best variable star monitoring that we have. Um, I work with great collaborations that have professional robotic telescopes that just take light curves from night to night. And sometimes the AAVSO light curves are just better. So I think that there's a great place for remote for amateur observing in this sort of volume of data that we're still working with. A down-to-earth question for you. 
But one of the things that we miss about being at Princeton and Peyton Hall for our meetings is uh, a speaker such as yourself, who we bring in, we'd have had you signing, autographing your book out <laughs> in the lobby. You wouldn't have gotten out of there for another hour. Um, <laughs> so we regret that. But my question is, do you track your book sales on Amazon? And I'm just curious, are you finding uh, the split between Kindle books versus paper books? Is there is that interesting? Like, what's that looking like? Do you know? <laughs> it's a, you, you've picked a great day to ask this question because I was ex I got a royalty statement from my publisher this morning. <laughs> and a question a question that we're actually exploring is how that's changed with the pandemic. Um, we were noting that the reported Kindle sales were actually lower than we had expected and that hardback covers were up. Um, I am cheating a little bit because it's a beautiful, beautiful hardcover book. If you, you get this like rendition of the Milky Way on the front and then if you take off the jacket, the book is actually starry. So maybe the book's just really pretty and people are literally buying it for its cover. But we were trying to suss out with the publisher just how big a role ebook sales play. And my impression is that the statement that we got was a little misleading. It might not fully count all sales, but I know that more and more people are reading um, primarily or even exclusively eBooks. Um, I, 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 my mom is a librarian and I grew up reading and I love books, but I read everything now on a Kindle app on my phone, which sounds ridiculous, but it means that I can carry a library in my pocket. I can carry thousands of books at arm's reach. So I do see the appeal of that, even though the hardcovers are pretty. And hopefully I'll have more data soon on how ebook sales are working period and how they've changed during the pandemic. Jennifer has her hand up. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious to say, um, why do you say that the explorers are vanishing? Oh, yeah, this is a good question. Um, I've actually had a lot of people ask me about the title of the book because it sounds depressing, right? I've sort of gotten the question of, you know, why is it the last stargazers or is stargazing ending or is exploring ending? And the title kind of serves two, pur two purposes. Um, it's, for one, I think a bit of a challenge that we don't want people to, you know, necessarily be giving up on exploration and giving up on stargazing. Um, we see the increasing encroachment of light pollution, and we do see a push to automation and sort of computationally based astronomy that mean people will oftentimes sort of work at home rather than work from um, work from a telescope and sort of have these adventures. Um, and that's kind of the other end of the sort of story of the title that Things have changed really dramatically in terms of how we do our work. We don't tend to travel to the mountain as much anymore. We don't tend to, you know, ride out a volcano in the midst of observations. We're more likely to observe remotely or robotically. And I wanted to sort of capture that time of when we really did go to telescopes and ride in them and, you know, slice photographic plates. It's an era that we might not be getting back, so it is disappearing but the adventure is disappearing perhaps not necessarily the curiosity or the science behind what we're trying to do you may have answered this question with your answer just now but uh i'll just put it out there again from a uh, member um how has your research for the last stargazers influenced your approach to your own research it's a great question. Um, I don't think anybody's ever asked me exactly that before. Um, so I got the chance to talk to over a hundred colleagues and a lot of these folks, um, the, the most interesting thing in interviews was people would tell me great observing stories, but then we're all astronomers. They couldn't help it. They just started telling me about the science. And I heard about decades of research and how big a deal it was to discover the first quasar or how exciting it was when you would get observations of, you know, one exoplanet. And looking at how the scale of the field has changed now has me looking at what I'm doing now and thinking, well, how is this going to change in the next 10 years? And the research that feels very familiar and normal to me is going to be, I'm sure, a little adorable and archaic to students even in 10 or 15 years. And I think about how this research can sort of grow. 
Um, so one example is I'm doing a lot of work with an eye toward what we can use from Rubin Observatory when it comes online. Um, those observations that I took on board Sophia, um, first of all, I absolutely wound up getting finding a good research reason, but a bit of a good research excuse to take some observations with Sophia because I wanted to fly on the plane. But those observations were also taken in part because they were looking at mid-infrared light. Right now, we can only observe that with Sophia, but we will very shortly be observing that with James Webb, hopefully. And this is the idea of sort of laying groundwork and understanding how stars might look in a wavelength range that we can't study yet. And the hope is that the observations we got with Sophia will sort of serve as a template or a starter pack so that when James Webb turns on and starts observing stars, we'll already know what to look for, we'll already have a sense of how to optimize the telescope. Um, it's basically giving me a bigger sense of timeline and of looking at how the field evolves and how you can sort of get ready for the next stage of evolution in a way that will keep the science as exciting as possible. Um, Emily, I think you're obviously preaching to the choir here in many, many ways, but how do you answer the question from people who ask, what is this for? Why, why are we doing this? Why are we spending money to do this? Yeah, it's, um, I actually like when people ask this question and it sounds like a belligerent or challenging question, but I know it's something that's on a lot of people's minds that we have really limited resources right now. We certainly have limited resources for scientific research. Um, and especially these days, and especially looking at all that's happening in the world, it's hard to try and convince people of why astronomy matters. And for one, I d dislike the idea that this is a singular choice. Um, I dislike the idea that there's, you know, one dollar to be spent on scientific research should we be spending it on medical research or astronomy. I challenge the idea that there's just one dollar. And with even a little more funding and a little more support and just a tiny bit more resources, we can make such amazing strides in astronomy and in so many other areas of scientific research that I think the real question is not pick a piece of science to care about or pick a piece of the universe to care about. It's how do we get a little bit more support for the universe? And I also just think that astronomy is a great I think that there's something to be said for the effect it has on people emotionally. Um, in the middle of the pandemic, it was very interesting to work on sort of promotion for this book and gearing up for the release of this book and asking myself, you know, well, why does this really matter? And just before the book came out, we had um, that, oh, I'm blanking on its name right now, the comet that made a wonderfully close flyby back in July. Um, and I remember going out to a field here in Seattle and observing the comet just with binoculars. And I was with more people than I had been with in months in the middle of the pandemic. And we were all in our own little groups. We all had our masks on. We were all six feet away, but we were all doing the same thing. We were all pointing at this comet. And I knew that all over Washington, all over Oregon, all over California, all over the planet, wherever people could see this comet, people were doing the same thing. And it gave a nice little sense of sort of being a human citizen of the planet, as opposed to being bickering humans with other problems. Um, I think that the pandemic was a case where we sort of felt a sort of global, yes, Comet Neowise, somebody put the name in the chat. Um, so that comet was a great example of people coming together for something sort of triumphant or something sort of joyful, as opposed to what we're more used to, which is sort of coming together through tragedy or something sad happening. I think that studying space is one of the only chances we get to sort of feel like a planet in a good way. So that those are the various reasons of why I think astronomy is an important thing to study. And, uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the concerns with optical astronomy from the Earth's surface is with all the satellites that are being launched and you know, the, the swarm of satellites. What's your thoughts on that and where we should be going? Oh yeah. Um, so I think I think when people mention um, the satellites, you're primarily thinking of Starlink, and I'm I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the general issue of Starlink. But these are these huge satellite constellations 
that are going to be honestly causing a great deal of problems in the night sky. Um, I think astronomers right now are hoping that there's some kind of mitigation strategy. Um, they, I know that you know SpaceX launched one of these hundreds of satellites with a special dark coating to see if that would help with the reflectivity. I don't think it did that much. Um, another was launched with a little sunshade to try and block the sun reflecting off the satellites. Um, this sort of helps fix the optical issue. Um, radio astronomers are petrified of these because they emit in the K band and they produce huge amounts of radio interference. Um, I think the worrisome thing for us right now is that this is simply regulated by the FCC rather than by people concerned with preserving or taking care of the night sky. Um, I certainly don't think the solution is to go to zero satellites. And I know that some satellites are really important to have an operation, but I think that getting some sort of collaboration between the people who want to launch things and the people who are trying to preserve the night sky is critical. If we're going to be able to keep doing our research, if we're going to be able to keep observing, if people are going to be able to effectively stargaze in a few years. Um, so I know that there's people in the field of astronomy that are really working hard on advocating for a sensible approach to launching heaps of satellites that hopefully prevents really serious problems from coming up. Okay, any uh, last questions? Just a comment to, uh, you were talking about Neowise. We had a very similar situation with um, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. Middle of December, we're out in the uh, Washington Crossing State Park. We had about 25 people, I think. And it was just a great time just to get a group of people together looking at something that's happening in the sky. And it was it was a great feeling. Here, well, here. I guess yeah. we're gonna let you go, Dr. Lebeck, yeah. that you have given us hope and you've given us some inspiration. We loved your message and it's gonna stay with us for a while. So thank you very deeply from AAAP for spending the evening with us and best of luck in your future research. It's great, thank you. Thanks, and thank you so much for inviting me again. So yeah, this, is a, this serves as a good introduction now, since uh, Tom, you're captivating us with your observational skills. Um, Tom has agreed to spend a little time telling us what he's been up to. So we're going to call this Journal Club. And remember, Journal Club is really a, uh, it's very far reaching. It's a philosophical approach to astronomy and it's all about sharing. So Tom, I'll yeah. quit sharing. I'll turn it over to you and you got the floor. Okay. Everybody see me okay and hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, uh, about three weeks ago, before I went on vacation, I was perusing Cloudy Nights Forum, and a gentleman had posed a question about how you could possibly use a finder scope for a low-cost uh, way to track uh, using a telescope. You know, the um, I'm grasping at straws here for the like a tracking scope rather than the little tiny six by 30, you know, 30 millimeter ones you get from ZWO, he wanted to know if you could use a 50 millimeter finder scope. So this discussion went on for a little bit and the conclusion one, yes, it, it was that yes, you can. And then another guy chimes in and says, I actually attached one of my cameras to it and it makes kind of an interesting wide field telescope at using a Celestron 50 millimeter finder. And he took the visual back off and replaced it with some hardware and he stuck his camera in the back and he got some pictures. And I go like, well, heck, I can try that. So I happen to have a 50 millimeter university optics finder, which supposedly has very nice doublet in it. It's just an acromat. It's F4, 50 millimeters, 200 millimeters long. So here's an example of what it looks like, um, the scope, and then it just has a plain um, one and a quarter inch visual back. And I had to add a little extension on here. And then you just slip your camera in there. The real fun to doing this was how do you focus it? <laughs> which basically was okay turn the camera on 
point it at Vega and just keep moving the camera until, oh, look, now it's in focus. And that, that's the whole extent of what you can do to focus. And um, I had it on a guided mount. So, okay, it's in focus. I can see Vega. There's a lovely blue halo around it. Uh, not much you're going to do about that. So let's try poking it at some, you know, pointing it at some other targets. So I uh, first target was um, the, uh, yeah, NGC 457, the owl. And if I can, I'm going to fire this up and do, whoops, wait a minute. I need to do a share screen. Let me do it this way. I think it works like this, right? I hit share screen. All right. And then I launch my program, right? You could do it that way, yes. Or if I just hit share and then the, here, let me do this. That's okay, working. That seems to be working. We see a desktop. How's that working? Okay. Very nice. Oh, so cool. this is, this works is great. the owl. Tom, looks great. This is the owl, and I calculate. I did a. I used um, um, in Sky Safari on the Mac when you added a quick piece of equipment to the list, it'll give you the approximate um, degrees, and this is about two point two by one point two degrees. So you could fit some pretty nifty targets in here, and yeah, there's a little bit of blue around. You know, some of the brighter objects, but for EAA, and you can see at the edges, you kind of got your stars are looking like comets, but you know, middle of the picture looks okay for, for EAA. So then here's a, let me do this. Uh, let's see, you, let me do the slideshow here. So here's this one. Um, and this is M15. And again, a lovely blue halo around that bright white star, but not too bad. And then I figured, okay, let's go after something completely different. There's Andromeda. Wow, nice. Yeah, that's nice. So again, these are this one. I act. Well, I should say this as well. Those previous um, pictures, they're like three second frames, and you take like five of them, and you've got all the photons you need because the, it, it's such a wide field. It's F4, it just sucks in light like crazy. Got M32 really nice there too. Yeah, the, um, now this camera that I was using, this is the ASI 385, which I had a dark for it, but there's no cooling. It's really not a deep space object camera because it does, it is relatively noisy. And uh, I'm looking forward to, I'm gonna put my other camera on here, the 533. And that'll give me almost a three and a half degree field of view in a square. So, uh, but I, I also uh, fear that the edge distortion is gonna be fierce, but eh, you know, <laughs> it's fun. And then uh, the other thing this has enabled me to do is to get some interesting asterisms that you can't normally grab with a scope. So I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is this asterism that Jennifer and I always laugh about. Ribbit. It's, it's a giant face. So here's one eye, here's the other eye, and here's the smile. <laughs> Ribbit. Yep. The we frog the, face. We call it the frog face. And Ribbit. it's in, um, um, I'm gonna butcher the name, Dave. You know where it is. <laughs> A re, a re, yeah, I can't say it. Ariga, Aruga, Ariga, Ariga. Thank you. And uh, that's my uh, that's my little quick presentation. I love the frog face. That is so cool. Yeah, it is wonderful. Go back can, to the go back to the owl. Oh, back to the owl. Okay, there he is. I like that red star in the armpit. That is so cool. <laughs> We were showing that the other night. Yep, it's a red super giant. Yeah. That's so cool, Tom. Oh, how much did you spend for your finder scope, Tom? Uh, I think I bought that at that astronomy. I can't, where was the name of that place? It was that astronomy auction, flea market. Yeah. Uh, I, 
NJ. NJ A A. Yeah, up in yeah. Um, uh, Clinton, up in yeah, uh, outside of Clinton. Yeah. yeah, I think I paid uh, twenty dollars, and it came with a diagonal and an eyepiece. <laughs> The camera, your camera costs way more than your scope. Yeah, that camera, oh, every, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> but uh, it was just, I just wanted to try it to see how it would work. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. And uh, what I uh, was going to do is I'm going to take some, um, do some more testing with this um, and uh, use the other camera and uh, just put together a brief article to put on uh in the newsletter at some point in the future. Awesome. And that's my story. <laughs> Love it, Tom. Really, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It was fun. <laughs>